Hi guys. Um, welcome to Friday Hacks uh, 230. 229, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we have two speakers today. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Indian. They was, they'll be talking about how Superbase built uh, launch storage. And then it's followed by Shi Jie from um, Jane Street. They will talk about how he built an exchange, how to build an exchange. Yeah. So uh, let's welcome Indian first for the, our first talk. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's good to be back. I uh, am Indian. Today I'll be talking about uh, how Superbase launched storage, which is one of our products. Um, yeah. So a bit about myself. I am a senior software engineer at Superbase. Superbase is like the open source Firebase alternative. Um, how many of you have heard about Superbase before? Okay. See a few hands, not bad. How many of you have used it or are using it for some project? Nice. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at everconfusedguy. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about it myself. Yeah, so I graduated from NUS uh, School of Computing at 2014. Yeah, so I'm pretty, feels pretty old. But yeah, uh, after that, I worked in the system security lab. Uh, in SOC for like one, one and a half years. Uh, it was sort of an extension of the project that I find my final year project. Uh, I worked uh, with a few other people uh, on uh, web security and my project was basically on how to find and fix cross-site scripting vulnerabilities automatically in websites. So that was a fun project. We found bugs in like the New York Times, the US Green Card website, or cross-site scripting bugs, uh, our tool was able to find it and fix it automatically, which was fun. And yeah, we published a paper and uh, I sort of was thinking on what to do, whether sh should I like, you know, go more into research, but startups sounded more fun. So I sort of convinced uh, uh, a professor here to so sort of um, start the company with me. So that's sort of my first startup that I did. It was a company on finding and fixing soft, uh, web security bugs. And that, that sort of evolved over time. We sort of shifted from security to performance. If you're interested in why or like want me to go more into that, be happy to sometime. Uh, but yeah, we were used to work at many different places. One of the places where we worked was like the hangar here. We worked at... Uh, SOC's also incubator. I forgot what the other one was. Uh, but yeah, we worked at a lot of different places. We also got into the y, y Combinator Fellowship Program um, and yeah, ran the company for some time. And yeah, so this was my uh, friend from college as well. We started the company together once I decided that, hey, I wanted to do like a startup in, uh, based on the research that I did. So we started Dex Secure based on that. So now I am at Superbase. Superbase is also, uh, so the previous company, as I mentioned, was uh, into web security and later web performance. So that was also mainly focused on developer tools and hel helping developers write fast websites. Uh, Superbase is also a developer tools company. If you have used Firebase before, we sort of build uh, the, try to get the developer experience of Firebase with a different set of technologies. And the main thing is that it's open source. We have a database. So if you uh, spin up Superbase locally or you sign up on our platform, you essentially get a full-fledged Postgres database. And that's one big differentiator from uh, Firebase, which gives you a NoSQL database. I mean, both have its trade-offs, but uh, personally, I'm biased and I tend to prefer Postgres. Um, and yeah, these are all the different products that we have. I'll quickly grow over a few of them. But essentially, the ideas that we tend to provide the primitives that you require when you lo are launching a new project or like a new idea and you want to get started quickly, we try to do that in a, in a nice way. So storage is what I'll be talking about now. So if you have used Amazon S3 or a blob storage before, it's sort of similar to that, but uh, we built it in a slightly different way. And today I'll be talking about what how we try to optimize the developer experience when um, you use Superbase storage. Authentication is auth. So any 
website or a mobile app will require authentication to sign up and sign in users, you probably need an OAuth provider like GitHub or um, Facebook, or uh, we have like 15 uh, different providers, I think at this point. So with a few lines of code, you can add sign-ins for your website uh, with the authentication product. Edge functions is a way for you to simply write you can code without thinking too much about the infrastructure itself. You write your code and the code gets deployed in different parts of the world. Um, real time is a way for you to get database changes. So every time you change a row in your database and you want to listen to it and react to changes, that's uh, what real time does. And Vault is also a secrets management solution built into Postgres. So everything that we built, the main idea is that we want to tie it deeply into Postgres itself. So that uh, so that's the main thing that you'll see is different from what we do. And since you get direct access to the Postgres database, that lets you do a lot of interesting things. Oops. Oh, the function shouldn't say coming soon. It's already deployed. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk about super-based storage. Um, oh, I forgot my demo is not here, but okay, I'll just go through it. So uh, when we started uh, building storage and trying to think of like what primitives that we want and how to expose that to users, the main thing that we wanted to do is like, we already had a database at that point and we wanted storage to integrate with the database somehow pretty well. And we also had an authentication solution that I talked about, and we wanted the storage to also integrate with the auth solution that we had. We also wanted a small footprint. Uh, most dev tools companies these days have like a very generous free tier. That's how you sort of get people to try out your product. And because we had that free tier, we had to make sure that whatever we run wasn't like, didn't take too much resources to run, which also meant that it was easier to operate, easier to scale, and yeah, that was one of our constraints that, hey, to launch a storage service, you don't need like 10 different things. We wanted to keep the footprint as small as possible. We also wanted a multi-tenant solution. Uh, it's much easier to manage a few servers serving thousands and tens of thousands of customers instead of launching, say, one server per client, essentially. So we wanted the solution that we ended up going with had to be multi-tenant. And we are also focusing mostly on companies which are already on the cloud. We didn't really care about companies uh, who wanted to run this on their own bare metal servers or something like that. Uh, our main target audience are already customers around the cloud who are uh, either self-hosting on the cloud or using our platform. And obviously we run on the cloud as well. So there were a lot of different options. Like if you have heard of Ceph, uh, Minio, all these tools let you essentially give the service a bunch of hard disks and it sort of helps you manage objects on top of these hard disks. Uh, the main reason that we didn't go with these guys was that it didn't integrate with Postgres. So all of them came with their own data store. Some of them require HCD, some of them require Redis, some of them required Kafka. All these things were like not, uh, we already provision a full-fledged database for our customers. And if we had used the, any of the existing solutions, we would have to also provision this extra thing uh, for our users, which didn't uh, sit well with us. So yeah, uh, Minio uses HCD, Zenko uses MongoDB and Kafka, and they also came with their own authentication systems, which would be different from the auth system that we already had. And we could have tried to figure out a way to sort of link both of these systems, but that would have been not as elegant. And we try to make the developer experience as good as possible. And having two different auth systems didn't seem like a nice thing to sort of uh, toss it on to off to developers and say, hey, if you want to use storage, use this auth system. If you want to log in users via a magic link, use this system, right? And they also came up with a lot of features that we don't necessarily need. So for example, a lot of the code in these systems are essentially for, hey, what if one server fails? Like how does the, how is the objects already replicated across multiple disk drives and stuff like that? How to pre pre prevent against bit route prediction? All the stuff we didn't really care about. They are useful if you are managing your own hard disk and your own data center and stuff, but uh, we didn't have that use case. Yeah. 
so this is sort of like the architecture that we have. Uh, so there's like the dashboard, the client libraries, Kong is like an open source API gateway. That's where all the authentication, rate limiting, uh, caching, all of that stuff happens. The storage API server is what we ended up building. So since none of the existing solutions fit our requirements, we decided to build our own. And that talks to Postgres and the objects itself are stored in S3 or Backblaze. So that's like the high level overview of what we ended up going ahead with. And the other few things that we decided to do is like, um, it, how many of you have heard about or used S3 or GCP's cloud storage before? Yeah, okay. So if you have used S3 specifically, you basically know that it comes with a lot of food guns in its, itself. So first thing is that if you, it has basically a uh, max upload size of 160 GB. And since our target audience is very different from AWS's target audience, right? Like uh, our target audience are people who are building websites, mobile apps. There's very little use case where you would want one object to be 160 GB. And so by default, we set the object limit to be much lower. So 50 MB, of course it's configurable to like any, any size that you want, but like the default is like a much smaller value. Uh, any object that you upload to something like S3 is not cached at all. And a lot of people, they want to build a website, they put the object on S3 and then unless you actually go to your network tab and see uh, the request, you'll notice that the objects aren't cached by default. Um, so the browser will make a request to S3 every single time, even if the object hasn't changed. With Superbase, we decided, okay, we are going to cache everything by one hour. You can, again, it's just the default. If you want to not cache the resource, like what S3 does for some reason, you can still do it. The other thing, I don't know if I mentioned it here. The other thing is like, yeah, with S3, the buckets used to be uh, public by default. I think it's changed now. Uh, we also have, private buckets by default. And like we show you like a lot of different warnings to say like, hey, are you sure you want to make this bucket public? Anyone in the internet can access your buckets and so on. Um, so yeah, the other uh, main thing that sets us apart from uh, solutions that we had is like the metadata about your objects is also stored inside the database itself. So which means that if you upload, we have three different buckets like avatar screenshot and each of that bucket has a few objects. It's as simple as having two tables. And every time you upload, delete objects, this metadata sort of cons kept consistent with uh, what's being stored in your Superbase project. The main uh, reason why this is helpful is because if you want to sort of find out like how many objects were uploaded to storage from uh, yesterday from 12 a.m. to 2 p.m. by this user, it's a simple SQL query. Uh, with AWS, you need to figure out what's the REST API. You need to find out like if they have a client library, you need to loop through all the objects because that you can't sort of search directly uh, with metadata like this. But again, this is sort of like a SQL hello world, right? You just write a SQL query, you get the list of objects, and then you can download the objects or delete the objects or whatever you want. Uh, and again, this also is to make sure that we use the Postgres database that we provision to our clients. And that's one of the reasons why we do this. Um, oh yeah, the other thing is like, we are always trying to balance like performance and security and like uh, performance and DX security and developer experience. Usually if you sort of have to make things harder uh, to make it more secure, if you need to make people jump through more hoops to make uh, stuff more secure and that's, by definition sort of makes the developer experience harder if you're trying to do something, right? So there's always a balance and we try to, there are a lot of different ways in which we try to make sure that, hey, Superbase is secure by default, but also we try to figure out what is the best possible experience that we can give to users. So yeah, as I mentioned, buckets are not public by default. Uh, you need to sort of create signed URLs for, uh, each object that you want to expose publicly. So these signed URLs is essentially a way for you to expose an individual object for a fixed amount of time. And yeah, we just make it super hard if you want to create a public bucket. Oh, this, I think I already sort of went through. Um, we have a Postgres database. We give full control of the database to the user. 
so it literally means that you can use uh, psql to uh, log into the database and do whatever you want it's not like just gated by the api which makes it actually simple to even do stuff that we don't support yet so for example when we first launched long time ago uh, not long time ago two years ago two and a half years ago we didn't have backups but since it was uh, just a postgres database you can literally do a pg dump of your database and store it wherever you want so it by having the right escape hatches at the right points in the stack you sort of let and our target audience is also developers right developers fix problems if they run into a problem and if the platform doesn't support it our job is to just make it easier to solve those problems so that's one reason why we want to store uh, all the metadata and all the data in the postgres database and give direct access to the database to the user yeah there are obviously some problems with this approach also because like say since the metadata is inside the user's database what happens if they come and delete the objects table or what happens if they write uh, some migration inside that table which conflicts with an upgrade that you're trying to apply so there is again no free lunch and like we are trying to give control to the user at the same time we also need to maintain the integrity of our platform so there are different things that we are doing to sort of balance both of that um so one thing that we do is like we, you can see all the storage tables from the dashboard but we don't let you modify the schema of the tables from the dashboard itself you can still do it if you directly connect to the database via like psql or something like that uh and at that time we sort of assume that hey if you're doing that you really know what you're doing and we let you do it but of course if something goes wrong then it's sort of like uh you have shared responsibility with us if like uh whatever change you are making to our internal schemas conflicts with say an upgrade that we are making yeah so i'll talk a bit about our auth system this is just like a very high level overview but yeah users sign in via different authentication mechanisms and they get a jwt uh this using this jwt they can access different products in superbase so they can access the database they can access the storage system functions uh all of it is based on the jwt that the user gets um after they log in successfully and this is uh, the auth system called go true it was initially developed we sort of forked it and customized it and added more features based on what we needed so i yeah this is about how we designed our authentication system for storage so now you have a bucket a bucket has like hundreds of different objects obviously you don't want all your users to access all the objects in the bucket so you need to sort of figure out how do you give permissions to certain users to access certain objects so that's the problem we are trying to solve and different companies do it in different ways so if you look at firebase you sort of need to know this custom dsl to match a particular path and then you can say hey uh yeah you can either allow read access write access based on certain path and you sort of need to know this custom language to be able to write these policies which means that you also need a debugger if something goes wrong you need to have syntax highlighting if something goes wrong so you sort of need to build this entire ecosystem to make the developer experience good if you sort of invent your own language aws s3 policies i've been using aws for a long time but still a nightmare to sort of figure this out properly um and again the point is that it's a custom language that aws developed it's not based on a standard or anything like that so when we we didn't want to do this we wanted to figure out a way to let users write rules which would grant or deny access to users for storage and that's when we realized that um hey if you are using the database you probably know a bit of sql already so we are trying to figure out if you can use sql to enforce the authentication for storage and the advantage of doing this is that you don't need to learn one more new language you probably know sql already um and the thing is like there are sql parsers all of already out there are sql formatters already out there so it's uh by using an existing standard we were able to leverage the community and the ecosystem of the tool 
So how that works is that basically we make use of a feature called Postgres role level security. What that means is that any table in the database, you can attach a policy to that table. The policy can, it's a Postgres native feature. It's not something that we built, but what that policy lets you do is that this policy, for example, says that, hey, create policy, this is the name of the policy on the use table and allow users select access to this table if the ID matches the current user ID. So that's Postgres low level security. You can, uh, what this, if you apply this policy to that table and if the user with ID, for example, one comes and makes a query saying select star from users, the, even th though you notice there is no where clause in this, the permissions is sort of enforced at the Postgres level itself. So if someone tries to do a select star, because of that role level policy, they can only see the record belonging to them because of that policy. So that's Postgres low level security. Um, and what we essentially did is we sort of used this to define our own permission systems. So the main insight here is that what we decided to do is like, since we already store the object metadata in the storage schema, we were able to say like, okay, if a user is able to read a particular row in the objects table, they can also download the object. If they are able to delete a particular row in the object table, they're also able to delete the object. So that's sort of how we enforce the rules. So we tell the user, hey, if you don't want the user to read this object, write a row level security policy, which prevents the user from uh, writing the, uh, deleting the object. So this is a actual policy that you can write in Postgres. So you just write a policy saying like, hey, I love this user to access to its picture on the storage.objects table. And when the bucket ID is avatars and the name is profile from p.jpg and the user ID is one, give give the user access. So this is the way you sort of enforce permissions in Superbase. And the main advantage here, apart from the stuff that I mentioned before, is that you get the full power and expressiveness of SQL. You can do whatever SQL can, right? You can even, for example, if you want, make a network call, ping an API, get the response back. I wouldn't recommend you do it, but like technically you can if you want to. Um, and we provide helper functions like the name of the file, folder name, and stuff like that to make it easier to write these policies. I'll probably skip this. So the other thing that we did is that this, the actual objects are still stored in something like S3 or Backplace or Google Cloud Storage. But yeah, what we do is like make it easier to implement your permissioning system, make it, uh, make the uploading easier, make the client libraries easier. If you're already using uh, the rest of the Superbase ecosystem, it sort of ties in well. And since we wanted to support multiple storage backends or where the objects are actually stored, we sort of adhere to the common S3 API. So S3's API has sort of become the industry standard. And since our storage system only depends on these six object uh, api methods any file system that not file system any object storage system which uh implements the s3 api our system is compatible with already so for some reason if you don't like amazon and you want to use gcp like you can bring your own uh you can launch our storage api inside gcp and point that to google cloud storage instead of s3 without any extra changes yeah, this is like how we designed our client API. If that was our API to access a particular uh, database or a particular table, you can see that it looks very similar. The first one was, this is what we came up with initially, but then we changed it to that. The main difference being like, it sort of mimics how the existing API looks like for uh, Postgres, which is the REST API on top of your database. And yeah, the final part, I just wanted to quickly go over uh, how we sort of implemented caching for your storage objects. So all Superbase projects are started in a single region. So you can choose which region you want your data to live in when you uh, start your project. So suppose say you choose Singapore, uh, your database is in Singapore, your API server for storage is also in Singapore. 
but obviously you want to cache your objects globally, right? And that's where content delivery networks come in, CDNs. And uh, the CDN that we use is called Cloudflare. Cloudflare has this product called Cloudflare Workers. Workers, uh, how many of you have heard about Cloudflare Workers before? Lambda functions, okay, okay. Uh, so workers are essentially functions or pieces of code that you can run on the CDN at the edge. The main advantage of doing that is that the code runs closer to your users and it's usually pretty lightweight compared to running a full container. So it can start up fast, run the code quickly and shut down. And yeah, the main advantage, as I mentioned, is like if your user is in US, this Cloudflare worker code runs near the user in US itself. And we sort of made use of Cloudflare workers to do the caching in a better way. So for public buckets, the caching story is pretty straightforward. You, someone accesses the object. The first time the CDN doesn't have an object, it goes and pings the origin server. Origin server is essentially a storage server in Singapore. It, uh, the storage server gets the object from S3, checks the, there is no permissions to check here. So it just gets the object from S3 and returns it back to the user in US. Now the next time a different user from US comes in, they hit the CDN and they directly get the object back because it's already cached over there. So this is fine for public buckets. Uh, the challenge comes in for private buckets. So for private buckets, that's where you need a JWT to access a particular object in the bucket. So you make a request with, a J suppose user one makes a request with the JWT the CDN doesn't have it, it goes all the way back to Singapore, gets the object. Now, when user two makes a request, it still needs to go all the way back because we don't know if user two has access to the object or not. So it still results in a cache miss. So the problem here is that, okay, if user two accesses the object again, it'll be cached. But if user three comes, again, they need to go all the way back to Singapore. So the cache hit rate becomes pretty low. Uh, and it sort of makes the CDN useless unless you have very few users from a single region. So that's where we are trying to figure out, okay, how do we improve the rate of cache hit? Because obviously the higher the cache hit rate, the faster the performance or how fast people can download objects from different parts of the world. And that's where uh, Cloudflare workers come in. So I'll go run through the cache miss part again. That's pretty much the same user one. But uh, when we get the object from the origin server, Cloudflare has an API called the cache API that's similar to the web standard. If you have used service workers before, uh, I don't want to get in there, but yeah, if you have used service workers before, like yeah, there's an API that browsers expose, which programmatically let you control the cache. And Cloudflare essentially gives you the same API to pr programmatically control their cache. So you can essentially say that, okay, uh, hey, Cloudflare, I want to put this object at this particular URL and return the object back to the user. Now, the second time the user comes in, we actually can't directly return the object from the cache because of we need to check the permissions, as I mentioned before. But this time what we do is instead of getting the entire object from the origin server, we just do a head request to the storage API and that story, uh, that still goes and checks Postgres, evaluates the role level security policy, checks if the user has permissions. But this time it doesn't return anything. It just returns a 200 or a 403. And then if we get a 200 from the origin server, we sort of get the response from the cache and then return it back. It's still not as fast as your public buckets because it still needs to go back all the way to the origin, but you sort of get the best of both worlds where you can check permissions on a per user level in your database, but uh, you also make use of the cache, which is there locally in the CDN. And this is far, again faster because like, if say if you're downloading like a 10 MB image or something like that, you don't need to do that full download from Singapore all the way back to US. You just need to do one call. It's a single API call. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of how we solve that issue. I guess that's it. Um, yeah, you can check us out at superbase.com. 
have any questions, I'll be hanging around or you can ask me now, I guess, if there's time. Um, yeah. And if you have any feedback on Superbase or like want to chat about anything else, I'm here. Thanks. Yeah, if there's time. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. So, um, so you mentioned that uh, for Superbase, you allow users to directly enter the Postgres and like point of the database, right? And uh, this is interesting to me because, um, the interface that exposed to users is what they can use, right? And they can abuse it to however they want to achieve whatever behavior they want. So, in this case, if Superbase exposes the database, I I would expect that uh, as you try and do, you know, um improvements to Superbase, let's say you want to change the metadata or something, there must be a lot of friction, right, trying to do that because the users will be like, oh, I require the metadata to look this way, the structure to be this way. So mm -hmm. have you experienced that in the past, like, two years that Superbase has been up? And how does Superbase um, treat such upgrades and treat such uh, technical changes? Yeah, that's an ongoing thing that we are trying to make it better because, as I said, it's a balance between saying that hey, you can't do this at all. And it's completely controlled. That's the easy way out, right? We can do that. But there are a lot of advantages to letting developers do what they want, as long as it's within your security model. Obviously, you don't want one database to make a network call to another customer's database or something like that. Um, and again, this restriction is only there for internal Superbase managed schemas. So storage, for example, creates its own schema. And the problem is, if, for example, as you said, someone relies on the structure of the metadata and we end up changing that. In most cases, we don't do that. Or if we try to do that, we do it in a backward compatible way. Mm -hmm. And in case where the only place where we might do a breaking change, if at all, is like if there's like a, if someone finds a security bug and we need to do a breaking change. But uh, we have started doing that for some of our products. How we do that is essentially we run both versions of the code at the same time, like the new version and the old version. We sort of give users a way to upgrade within a month. That's sort of what we are trying out now. And then users can, that way, instead of automatically upgrading users and breaking your applications, you get that one month window to upgrade to the new version. And then, yeah, you can't go back. You can only go forward for now. And then, after a month for users who do not upgrade, we automatically do end up upgrading them because if you don't do that, we'll end up running hundreds of different versions. And as a startup, it's just not possible to maintain so many versions at the same time, especially on the server side. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how we are handling the API. Uh, API as in like the storage API, but as you said, also the database structure is also a sort of API that we expose. So we also treat that as a breaking change if we do do that. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Uh, do you guys have any more questions? Mm. Okay, yeah, uh, let's thank uh, Indian again for the talk. Thank you.